Hi there, my name's Vince from MyMateVince.com and in this video today is going to be another fix it video. Another video where I bought something faulty off eBay and I'm going to do my best to fix it. Now as always, I'm not an expert in these repairs, so take this purely for entertainment and not as a how to fix video because often with these things I have never taken them apart before. So it's just interesting to take something apart that you haven't done before, see how it works and then do your best to fix it. Right, okay, so this is a Dreamcast. Now, I've never owned one of these. Should that lift up? Okay, got to look into that. Uh, so, yeah, I've never taken one of these apart before. From memory, I think the description said that it was uh, a faulty disk drive. So that's the power cable there. Nice to have the controller, so I haven't got the unit that plugs in here and uh, this is the display cable okay so it looks like it's just looks like it's RF right I didn't know that I thought it might be composite or something so obviously the quality is not going to be fantastic on that right okay maybe there's other cables you can buy looks like you can connect it up to the uh, Maybe it's got some sort of dial-in modem or something, or something because uh, it says line there. So maybe it had the option to do online play. Right, let me show you what I paid for this. Okay, so this is it here. As you can see, Dreamcast 40, one controller. And uh, it was £15 with £8 delivery. And he was accepting offers. So basically, I put an offer in for... £10.29 and he actually accepted it, £10.29. So I paid £10.29 plus £8 delivery, so £18.29. Interestingly enough, I've seen on this one here that he actually paid £13.75 for postage, which in my opinion was way too much. He must have sent it kind of some kind of like, uh, I don't know whether it's like special delivery or not, but there was no need to because it was such a cheap item. Unfortunately for him, he's not going to make any money off that. Even if he got the Dreamcast for free, by the time he paid that, PayPal fees and eBay fees, there's going to be very little money left. So, uh, yeah, I think he probably didn't work out how much the postage was beforehand. He should have just sent it normal second-class post. Well, OK, but anyway, that's not, that's not my problem. Now, there's very, uh, very little information with it. There's no other pictures. It just says here, Dreamcast with controller, no VMU. Display and power cable, console is faulty, disc tray is broken and does not read discs. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a TV down, connect it up and actually see, you know, see if I can work out what the fault is, make sure it is definitely that the discs are not being read, and then see if we can repair it. So this should be a little bit of fun. Right, okay, so I've plugged it all in. I've bought myself a cheap Dreamcast game because I never... Uh, I had a Dreamcast, so I haven't got any games. So I don't want to buy an expensive one, just purely because if I can't get it working, I don't want to spend £10 on a game that I might like, like, for example, Sega Rally. So I've just bought this one. It was the cheapest one on eBay. I can't remember how much it cost. I think it was £2, and that included delivery. So uh, let's first of all turn it on. Now, I've just got it on analog TV at the moment, but I might well have to tune this in. Right, OK, so it looks like it's nearly there. Okay, it's very noisy, really noisy, and the picture's not great. I would have thought that, uh, I mean, maybe you can buy different cables, but I uh, I would have thought, because this came out in 1999, I would have thought it would have at least been AV, you know, the composite, red, white, and yellow, yellow for picture, and red and white for audio, rather than RF, but perhaps there's loads of cables out there that you can buy for this. Right, okay, uh, set date, let's just... Get rid of all this. Right, okay, it's certainly working, so let's pop a disc in and see what happens. Right, so this thing here looks like it's jammed. Let's see if I can uh, prise this open. Hold on a minute, the whole thing's apart. Alright, oh, okay. Please wait while disc is being checked. Right, so it thought it had a disc in there. So obviously this has been opened up. Right, and that's loose as well. Well, let's just put the disc in and see what happens. Please wait while disc is being checked. Oh, 
Right, okay, so it looked like it tried to read it. I think I heard a disk drive there. Right, so as I go to close it, I just want to see what position it's in, see if it spins. So right now, it's saying planet ring over that way. So let's now see what happens. Yeah, it's spinning. It's spinning, but the uh, the lid has to be slightly open. Look, stop now. Now it's spinning. Right, okay, let's try to just lower it down using this. See, it's spinning at that level there. Right, okay, so it looks like it's something to do with some kind of sensor to let it know when the lid is closed. Because when the lid's closed, it's not doing anything. No, okay. Right, let's turn it off and then uh, take it apart and see if we can find out what's wrong with it. Right, so obviously I've got it unplugged. Unplug everything. Right, so the screws are missing from here and here. Missing and something's rattling around inside. See, does this, oh, that side thing comes off. So is it just three screws holding it all together? Oh, there's another screw there. So all the screws are missing, which is a bit annoying, but hopefully I might be able to get replacement. Oh, I found one screw there. That's useful. Maybe, let me double check that there's nothing in here. Might as well take that out as well. Looks a bit grubby. I'm not going to touch the lens, but around the lens looks a little bit grubby and dusty. So uh, that might need a clean. It doesn't look like there's anything in here. Looking forward to doing this one. Right. Okay, so we have got, that's just for a light, that's not a problem. We've got a spring here, but yet, is that spring working? Yeah, it is. But this thing here isn't working. And it looks like it's had some sort of glue put on it at some stage. So that says to me, and I don't know, but this mechanism here. There's no resistance there. Okay, also the hinge is broken as well. So I'm going to have to undo this side and find out what's happening. I'm not sure if you can get replacement parts for this. You know, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how cheap they are. Right, okay, so this must have something to do with door being closed. We've got something loose here. This is just a fan. Uh, that looks like it just gets screwed down to there. This is the on and off here. Right, okay, so... I've got a couple of little tabs there, I presume those wires are supposed to go under. So obviously this is, an, an, a repair has attempted to be done on this, but that doesn't mean that it's unfixable. I just want to see if this thing's moving. Yeah, that moves. Right, okay, so to me it looks like something to do with the fact that the lid isn't recognising it properly and as well as that, maybe this is dirty or maybe there is a problem with the reader here but to begin with we have to work out what's happening, you know, why it's not allowing this to be read, why, uh, you know, what's, what's going on with this bit here. So I think I'm going to dismantle this to begin with and see if I can work out what's snapped up, up in here. 
and unfortunately there doesn't appear to be any other screws around the place. I can hear something else rattling around. Right, it looks... This bit looks okay, and the circuit board must all be at the very bottom. Right, okay, so a repair on the hinge has been attempted because there's a load of glue around here and also this bit's missing. So there must have been a black plastic thing that was coming out here to go in to this hole here, which is now gone. Uh, could that be the cause of the problem? There must have been some sort of spring or something on this mechanism here to make the lid come open because at the moment the lid doesn't come open. So uh, there must have been That's just to make it go slowly. This little gear here is to make it go slowly rather than suddenly flying open. So obviously we're missing, we're missing some kind of spring. Right, but what I want to know is, how does it tap this button at the back? Right, okay, so basically what happens is, when it's like here now, uh, it's the same as the lid being open, and as the lid goes closed, it just comes along and it just taps that little bit back, and that's what allows a disc to start spinning. So this bit here just taps it back. So, although this is broken, it should allow it to tap it back. So yeah, it's annoying that you have to you know, use gravity by turning it upside down or a screwdriver to kind of prise it open. But still, when this is in place, it should still read a disc. So obviously, it's not reading the disc. Uh, so it's kind of, it's like it's got its levels mixed up. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start it up like this. I'm going to make sure I don't touch anything over here. Uh, obviously, you know, don't do this don't do this yourselves, meaning don't copy what you see in this video because uh, it will not be the safe way to do things. It's just that I want to see what happens when I, uh, I want to see what happens basically with the disc when it's in this orientation here. So uh, going into this now is 240 volts. So obviously You've got to take care because it's not been transformed down so it is live going into the side here so i'm not going to go anywhere near that side over there right, so that's off that's on and then when you close it it's the same as that Look, it's oh, there you go. I let go of it. Sorry, there. But it's stopping again. Look, right, okay. I'm going to plug it into the TV and I'm going to see, you know, the position where it's uh, I'm going to see the position where it spins fastest at. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start pressing it slowly and keep it, hopefully keep it still when I get to a certain position. Do you know what, I'm going to just do an auto-tune on this because uh, I did save that last one and it didn't stick, so just in case it's going to pick it up on a better channel, I'm just going to do an auto-tune. goes for a short bit and I'm, I'm not going all the way now so look if I go all the way it goes for a while then slows down but even if I just go a little bit it still slows down yep okay so that's all the way now let's just go until it starts moving I'm keeping it steady here I haven't moved but yet it stops again so it's like it hasn't got the power so I'm going to go about halfway in between them now Right, okay, so uh, I'll let the tuning finish, but there's no point in me messing with that because to me it's not, uh, it's got nothing to do with that switch, it's got nothing to do with that switch there. 
Right, there we go, it's picked that up now. Right, okay, I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to unplug it. And I'm going to start, I think I'm going to start dismantling it to see if I can see anything. Actually, what I want to check is I just want to make sure that this thing is actually moving. So I'm going to put it all the way out. It's all the way out there. And I'm going to turn it on again. Just to see if the if the thing's moving. Yeah, I've just seen it move. Right, okay. Now, let's see it now. Yeah, there you go, it's all the way in. So hopefully, uh, hopefully there won't be an issue with that. Maybe the fan was noisier than normal because it was loose. Interesting room and cable, it just seems to be a push fit in. I don't know if I'd want to be taking that apart too many times. There we go, okay. It's got a little battery there as well. That must be the clock battery to save the date and time. That ribbon cable looks a little bit dodgy on that side there. Also this thing looks like it's a little bit a little bit broken. Let's have a look now. Whoa. Okay, so that's how you take it off there. So it's just a connection here <laughs> that goes down to the uh, motherboard down there. Well, okay. Uh, I don't think I might not have to dismantle it further. Maybe I just need to concentrate on this area here since there's a problem with the reading of the discs, and then I can worry about you know the the lid and stuff afterwards. So uh, yeah, just you can see the ribbon cable there. Looks like it's had a bit of a bash. But it might be okay. It just might be a bit of a crease. Yeah, it looks like a tear, but it's not. It is just a crease. Right, okay. If I'm honest with you, I don't really know much about disk drives. Uh, I know you can have a uh, dirty lens there, which I might well clean up. In fact, why don't I clean that up right now by using a bit of uh, using a bit of 99.9% alcohol on it. Just give it a tiny little, tiny little touch. But uh, that wouldn't cause, or would it? Maybe it would cause. I'm thinking if it didn't. If it didn't read the disc, it could cause it, couldn't it? Because when you close the lid, it knows to start spinning the disc. But then if this doesn't pick up a disc because this is dirty, then maybe it will just stop spinning because it thinks the disc isn't in there. Okay, I'm definitely going to get I'm going to get a Q-tip and give that a clean. Right, so I'm just going to dip the Q-tip in here, then I'll zoom in and we'll see. We'll see what it's like. I'm going to give it a tiny... Wipe the dust from around it because just in case that was to come forward and land on it, on the, the lens there. Okay, uh, I'm going to let that dry off and then give it a go. The lens itself didn't look dirty, but then around the actual, uh, you know, around the lens there was little bits of dirt. I think I'm going to put that back in and just try it as it try it as it is there. So then I'll put it back in and let it dry bit by bit. Do all the screws up because 
I'll probably need to undo it all again. Definitely looks better now anyway. So it looks like that little battery must have gone because it keeps asking me to enter the, the date all the time. Right, okay. And in case you're wondering, the disc looks absolutely immaculate. It looks like it's never been used. Right, so let's do the old trick again and see if it works. No. Right, okay, so it looks like it knows there's a disc there, it's trying to read it, the laser is moving, but it hasn't got... It just stops. So the motors are obviously working. Mm, it's a weird one. Uh... Right, okay. I'm going to look to Google for this one because there might be a really obvious answer that I'm missing and in which case then because right now I'd be honest with you I don't know how to fault find this one right now because it's uh, you know it's spinning if it was a, a bad catch here then I could understand because obviously the hinge is broken isn't it hinge is broken here but that's a separate fault completely uh, yeah so when you go all the way it just goes so far and then stops So it's like it hasn't got the power, hasn't got the power to uh, to continue. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna check on Google and then see if that throws up anything, and then I can uh, I can go from there. Right. So I will be back very shortly. Right. Okay. So I've been looking into this, and uh, I think I might know what the problem is. So basically, what a few people have done is. They've tweaked the potentiometer. So basically, if you were to Google pot tweaking the Dreamcast laser, and basically pot means potentiometer, and what you have to do is you have to decrease the resistance of this to increase the power of the laser. So what you need to do is you need to turn it clockwise one degree at a time to decrease resistance, which will increase the, uh, obviously, increase the power. And it says that decreasing it by more than 50% can burn the laser up. So basically what you have to do is, I've got everything unplugged at the moment, if you have a look at the bottom here, let me just move this back, if you have a look at the bottom here, let me zoom right in to show you, it is basically this thing here. So what you have to do is you have to just turn this one degree at a time, so basically a tiny amount, and uh, then it's supposed to increase the power to the laser. Weird thing is, most people say to do it clockwise, but then a few uh, like things have been written up about doing it anti-clockwise. So I think the idea is that you make a note of where you're starting. So for example, this is the starting position here. Now I don't know if this has already been tweaked, because remember, this is not my Dreamcast. I bought it second hand off eBay, so maybe this has been done multiple times. And uh, you make a mark from here to here, and then so you know where you're starting is. So put a dot here and a dot on the back, and then you just start turning it. Now, if it gets to the stage where you've kind of turned it too much and it's not done anything, there's supposed to be like a sweet spot, then you have to turn it back and then possibly go anti-clockwise, but you just keep turning it a degree at a time until, uh, until you get it. Uh, there is already varnish on it, and looking at it there, if I look at it up top, it looks like the uh, the varnish. Let me look closer. It looks like it might have already been done. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It looks like the top little bit is red there, but then it looks like maybe I could be wrong. But the redness seems to be kind of at this point here rather than on top but uh, yeah and then 
I think the, the proper way to do it is to measure. So basically I read this thing and it varies from Dreamcast to Dreamcast, but one person started on 0.907 kilo ohms. I think that's how you say it. And then they finished up on 0.643 kilo ohms. So then by lowering it, they've then obviously increased the power to the laser. But it did say here decreasing it more by more than 50% can burn up the laser. So let's say if you were to start on, uh, you know, let's say 900, well 50% of that would be 450 less. So obviously if you were to go below 450, 0 0.450 kilo ohms, then I presume that's what it means by damaging it. Now I've drawn a little diagram here. There's two points that you can measure. So basically uh, it's these two bottom ones here. So I believe, if I was to spin this round here, it's these ones at the back here. So can you see three little points here? Yeah, so it's these three ones here that you would have to test. So it's the bottom two, I believe, that you'd have to test. Uh -huh. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. The ribbon cable. The ribbon cable's ripped. Look. I don't know whether that's me messing around with it or not. But look, there you go. There's a rip in the ribbon cable. Right, okay. I don't think it's probably, it's probably not worth me messing around with that potentiometer. Let's actually see, because what, what I didn't see was I knew that the the laser was moving up and down, but I didn't actually look for any red light. Ne never, ever, ever look at these red lights. And also, I must stress, don't touch anything on this side of the board. Right now it's turned off, but even still don't touch anything because charge will remain in those capacitors. So this side here, you remember there's 240 volts going in here, which is easily enough to kill you. It's not worth dying over a Dreamcast. So uh, I'm making sure that I'm not going near this side here, but don't do this. As I say, don't copy me really you would need to cover this up or work on it completely dead. I don't know how long it would take to discharge these capacitors, but they're not gonna discharge within a few minutes of turning the system off. So I'm taking care not to touch anything over this side apart from the on and off switch here. But uh, that's why really you shouldn't work on something like this. It's much better to work on something with uh, that's low voltage going into it. For example, like the Xbox One has an external power brick and then it's low voltage going in. So, uh, you know, it's much better to work on that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to look, not look at it, just from a distance, uh, the, see if the actual laser lights up or not. Because if it doesn't, that could be why. So let's turn it on now. Because I know it definitely moves up because I've seen it. But I don't know if it's actually, uh, you know, doing anything. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pretend I've uh, closed it. Let's see if it does anything. Whoops, hold on. No, look, it's moving up and down, but there's no red light, is there? And that's probably why the disc stops spinning, because it's not recognising the disc, because it's not uh, the laser's not got any power. I'm pretty sure that's the fault. As I said, I don't know much about disc drives, but that laser's not, that laser's not coming on. Well, I'm going to have to strip this down and have a look at that ribbon cable. I don't even know if you can buy spares for this or not. Yeah, that should be lighting up red. I'm almost sure of it. Let's turn this off. And let's uh, strip this down so we can get the ribbon cable out. Okay, let's unhook it from here. See what we've got going on. Actually, I don't need to, do I? I can just turn it upside down. Right, that's a nasty rip there. Nasty rip. Now, as I say, I wasn't. I'm not sure that could have been done by me, but I don't think so. I wasn't really rough enough with it. And remember, this has been taken apart before. But I don't think that would happen normally. I think maybe what's happened here is it's been taken apart possibly because the laser's not working, meaning that you know you have to increase the, the power to it. And then in trying to do that, maybe the previous person ripped the ribbon cable and then gave up on it completely. So even if I was to replace the ribbon cable, I might find that this still doesn't work. But uh, 
I need to get it out anyway, don't I? And with this ribbon cable here, it looks like it looks like I could just push it in again. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's a horrible way to do it. There we go. I'm going to really struggle to get that back in. There we go. You see, big big tear on it there. It looks like it's going. It looks like there's a line right the way across. I don't think that's going to be repairable. It looks very weak. It looks like it's about to go there as well. First of all, I'm going to price up how much these are, see if you can get them. Right, okay, so I priced them up, and if you actually type in Dreamcast, uh, you know, ribbon cable, then uh, the only one that seems to be selling it is a, a company, I think, there in America. And it, for me, it was going to be something like, I think it was like £13 plus another £8 or £9 postage. So obviously, it's not worth spending that. That's more than I actually spent on this Dreamcast. But what I did type in was, uh, I typed in 16 pin, 1 millimeter pitch, and then it did bring up other ones. And basically, I've ordered up, I think they're 70 mil, the, the, the proper ones are 70 millimeters long, so 7 centimeters, from Hong Kong. And there's going to be 10 of them arriving for only a few pounds, so really cheap. The problem is, because it's coming from Hong Kong and I'm in the UK, realistically, that's probably going to take like three or four weeks. So I had a look on CPC, which is a, a company in Preston. And basically, I got one, but it's too long. But that shouldn't really matter, I don't think, because I'll just see if I can lose this somewhere in it. You know, just like uh, if it's nice and flexible, hopefully it won't make a difference. So this is 15 centimetres long, but it is actually the perfect size. So it is uh, like 16 pins, one millimetre apart. So that's exactly the same as the one that came off it. Annoyingly, there's a crease in it, which is uh, which is a bit irritating because... That looks like where the last one failed. I'm just going to quickly go across it. I'm just going to fast forward through this. I'm going to quickly go across it just to make sure there's continuity because I don't want to put it in there and then think, oh, is there continuity? So I'm just going to do that now. Right, there's continuity. Good news is it was really cheap. I think it was £1.60 plus VAT or £1.60 something plus VAT. VAT. They didn't have a huge amount of them left, but so it's coming in at under £2. That's the uh, order number there. I'm not quite sure what that says at the beginning, but if you type in CPC 18217 and type in something like 16 uh, pin flex, I'm sure you're going to be able to find it. Right, OK, so that's what I'm going to be doing now. I've got to try to put this back in and uh, see, if it, uh, see if it works or not. Now remember, my thoughts are that this ribbon cable didn't naturally go faulty. My thoughts are that it was taken apart because there's a fault, and in taking it apart, the ribbon cable got ripped. Either that, or it's possible that I ripped the ribbon cable, but I really don't think I did, because I don't think I was that rough with it. So uh, i got to think that when I put this back in, I still don't think it's going to work, and I think I've got to adjust that. Uh, potentiometer. The problem with that is, why is it gone in the first place? There's obviously something failing for you to have to increase the power to it. So I'm sure, even if you were to get it working, I don't think it's a long-term fix. And the more I've looked into it, the laser seems to be the kind of Achilles heel of this system. And anything you read about it, everybody just says that the laser's failed. So I've got a feeling that uh, I might not be lucky with this one.
you see the cable is far too long I just want to see if this works now I thought it was worth spending the two pound just for curiosity uh, rather than having to wait for the weeks until the proper one arrived from Hong Kong so what I'm going to do is I am just going to I'm not going to plug it into the TV yet I just want to see if the disc does spin up so I'm going to plug it in get the disc let's see what it does right okay Let's see if it was just a ribbon cable. I don't think it will be, but let's see. Let's turn it on there. No, exactly the same as before. Right, I think we've got to tweak that pot and let's see, uh, see if that does anything. Right, okay, uh, yeah, my, do you know what I'm thinking? I'm worried that uh, I did read that, you know, that little potentiometer, that the flat bit should be at the top, and I remember earlier it was right the way around the side, so that's been tweaked like at a full 90 degrees. So I've got a feeling that what's happened is that this has been on its way out for ages, and then it's just been constantly tweaked and tweaked and tweaked, and I've got a feeling the laser is probably burnt out. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try and get a reading on it but the thing is it's kind of irrelevant because I don't know what the I don't know this to me looks like it's been tampered already remember the case has all been apart I definitely read that the thing should be flat up the top I mean I don't know if that's accurate or not I haven't got another Dreamcast to compare it to but if it's been already tweaked 90 degrees even if I do get a reading from it it's not really going to read much but still we're going to we're going to do it anyway and see uh, see if we can learn anything but first of all, I just want to make sure that the laser is definitely focusing up and down. Yeah, it is. I can see it moving. All right, if you watch, you can actually see it moving up and down. So that's good. There you go. All right. Weird thing is, there's no light, but I don't know if there should be a red light or not. Uh, again, further reading up, I could be completely wrong here, but I think it's the DVDs that have the red light. And I think the CD-ROMs are an infrared light, so I don't think it could be seen unless you were to use uh, an old camera, which I haven't actually tried yet. Uh, but on this one, it's not a CD-ROM, it's a GD-ROM. I think it's like something exclusive to... Uh, Dreamcast or maybe it was some other technology and Dreamcast took it up at the time uh, so I don't actually know if G but I think it's supposed to be based on the CD-ROM technology but listen I, I, I really don't know well okay let's uh, unplug it for the moment just while I take it apart and get it set up All right, so I want to be reading the bottom two pins so I'm going to set my meter here to ohms Actually, let me zoom out for the first bit so you can see the reading. But basically, these are the pins I'm going to try to go on. I don't know if it matters which way around, but I believe it's the bottom two pins. I'll see if I get any readings off it. If not, maybe I'll actually go onto the potentiometer itself. It might be easier for me. All right, so I've got my new meter here that I'm not overly happy with at the moment, probably because I don't know how to use it. But uh, it doesn't always give me the readings that I think it should give me. All right, okay. Let's turn this on. Now I'm going to do black to the bottom. Right, so 3.8 kilo ohms. 3.8 kilo, 3.8. Hold on now. That's, hold on. 3.8, I think I might have read that wrong. Let's try that a few more times. I'm just looking at what the results were with this other guy and he started on 0.907. Do you know what I'm going to do? I am going to just put it back to at the top where it should be and I'm going to get a reading then and see what see what happens. I need to get the right size bit for this. Oh, here we go. Right, okay. Now, 
at the moment now I've done the flat bits the flat bit flats with the actual sort of varnish and this is the thing now that I'm gonna be turning yeah and what originally it was around here yeah you can see the flat bit was to the right hand side so what I'm doing is just purely because I read that that bit should be up the top and on the forum the person sounded like he knew what he was talking about I'm gonna put that bit back up to the top and get a reading well actually I might as well put that bit to the top and see if it reads a disc would probably be more sense so I don't have to zoom in anymore now you can see what I'm going to be doing I'm just going to be moving this it says like one degree at a time so I'm just going to be doing a tiny fraction of a turn and I'm going to try to get a reading on each one and then basically I suppose what I want to be doing if I want more power to go to the laser then maybe I need to get it to finish up around about 0.43 kilo ohms but that was somebody else's Dreamcast and that might not be the case with this. Maybe it will work higher, maybe it will work lower, maybe it won't work at all because the laser's already been burnt out. So there you go, you can see now what I'm talking about. So let me zoom right the way out. No, okay. Right, I think I need to look into other things uh, because if it's a burnt out laser then I could be doing this all day long and it wouldn't make a blind bit of difference. Right, so I'm going to uh, Google some more information. Right, this is interesting. Now, maybe you guys can see the red light every time I do this through the uh, camera. No, I can't see it there. I should be able to see it through the viewfinder but interestingly enough when I use this digital camera because if this is infrared then some old cameras and stuff can pick it up uh, Steve from Tronics Fix taught me that so uh, if you have a look now I'm pointing it at the laser there and if you have a look now I don't know whether you can see that coming on or not hold on you can see it goes from blue to red there you can see it better now Right, ready? Right, okay, so obviously you don't mess around with this with your own eyes. Right, although this sounds like a, a silly thing to do, I've uh, looked online and there's one forum where somebody's recommending this and then a lot of the other posters have been saying, yes, thanks, it worked for me. So basically, it's uh, a car product that's supposed to restore plastic. Now, I don't think it etches into it or anything like that. I think all it does is fills the scratches to make it look clean and then I think it wears away again after so many weeks or months and then it needs to be done again. So I believe if there's loads of scratches, if you were to zoom right up close to those scratches, let's say if they look like a V, so if you have like a plastic, or well, pretend we have the lens here, if there was like a V out of it, then I believe that this fills up that V to make it, uh, I don't know, to possibly allow the laser to go through it better so I might as well give it a go because I've kind of run out of other run out of other options now so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a tiny little bit onto here and then I'm not sure if you're supposed to shake this and then I'm going to use a cotton bud and I'm just going to gently put it on and then I've got a microfiber cloth to wipe it off
Right, let's see if that's made any difference, uh, any difference at all. Oh, interesting, that time I turned it on, I didn't have to do the date again, so it, uh, maybe the battery's okay. Battery's okay, but the disk drive don't work. No. Well, to me, I can't find anything wrong with it, but I'm sort of concentrating all my efforts here. But I haven't even looked at the motherboard yet. I haven't even looked at this power supply board over here. What happens if, for example, there's something over here which is not providing enough power to maybe the motor so it can't spin up to speed or even the laser? Because, you know, a lot of people online are on about, you know, doing this, uh, uh, you know, the potentiometer, tweaking it. But you see, it doesn't work for everybody. So that might work for some people, but maybe there's something else. Maybe there's a faulty capacitor or something somewhere else which isn't allowing all the power through to where it needs to get. So no matter how much I tweak it, if the power's not getting into it to begin with, then it's not going to output on here. So uh, that's what I'm going to work on now. I'm just going to basically just dismantle it. Uh, now, to get the power off this side here, I've unplugged it all. I'm just going to keep turning it on and off. I don't know, maybe 10 times or something like that. Once I take this board out, maybe I might try to short out a couple of the capacitors because there's still going to be voltage remaining in here. Uh, and obviously, I don't want to get a shock off that, even though it's been disconnected now. That's just the uh, RF cable, this one here. But even though it's disconnected here, there still will be charging those capacitors. So I'm just going to do this in the hope that it will discharge most of it. Then I'm going to dismantle it and uh, see, uh, you know, see if I can see anything obvious. If I can find anything obvious, then of course I will uh, film it and let you guys know what I see, if I see anything at all. Okay, so if you look at the date of this case, it says uh, 00, so it must be 2000. First month, so January 2000, and you've got Japan, USA, and multi, so multi must be for, the, for Europe, I presume. Right, so I've got it all apart now, and I'm just going to, uh, you know, look to see if I can see anything, uh, you know, anything that doesn't look right or anything. I mean, it all looks... This board looks absolutely immaculate, it looks pristine. So, but that's not to say that there's a component, you know, that there's not a component that's failed on it. Am I going to be able to find that component? No, I won't be able to find it. But what I might be tempted to do is I might be tempted to unsolder the capacitors from here and try to get some readings from them. But uh, I did buy a pack of capacitors actually while I got the, while I got the ribbon cable from CPC. But there's, uh, I think there's one or two that's contained in here, but in here we have some pretty, pretty big ones. Like this one coming in here is 400 volts, and there's some other ones that are like 16 volts, but 1800 microfarads. So there's pretty, uh, you know, they're pretty big capacitors compared to the the pack that I got. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Don't really know what I'm looking for now, if I'm honest with you. But maybe I can do the capacitors just to see. As I say, this might not be anything to do with it. It would be good if I could have another Dreamcast, because then I could swap parts about. Because, for example, if I just swapped over the drive over there, the laser, then I would know it's that. But right now I'm thinking, you know, could it possibly be this power board here? But if I had another one, I could just swap them. But I haven't. This is the only one I've got. So it's kind of hard to do fault finding. But that's what I'm working on at the moment. Right, OK, so uh, I've taken it apart. And it's actually in very good condition. You know, everything looks spotlessly clean. There was a little layer of dust just on the very bottom of it, but nothing excessive. So what happens is it looks like the mains voltage comes into here, gets transformed down, and then to get the power into the motherboard so it can be distributed to, for example, the controller ports and also up to the laser, you know, the uh, drive up here, the GD-ROM, uh, it does it via these pins here. Now, everything looks perfectly clean. It doesn't look like there's anything wrong with it. You know, if you look there, it doesn't look like there's a load of corrosion or anything. But I am going to push it down just in case, you know, just in case, for example, over the years, maybe, I mean, I can see a little bit of dirt on here. Maybe, uh, maybe one of them wasn't making a good contact or something. It is, it is possible 
It's unlikely, but it's possible. So uh, I am just going to put it back together and just to see uh, see if it will work again when I uh, when I do it. And if not, I think I'm going to look into desoldering these capacitors and just use the capacitance thing on this meter here just to see what uh, if I'm getting anything. No, it's doing exactly the same as it was before. See, when you push the board forward, it, you can see the pins move in there, so... It is possible that that could go faulty, but I don't think that's any issue in this case here. Right, I'm just checking the voltage here now. So if I turn it on, uh, the ground pin is this one, the third in from the edge. And this one here says on the board 3.3 volts. And you can see it is reading 3.3. Next one is 5 volts. See it's reading 5 volts and the last one here is 12 volts. It says 14.33. I think it said 12 volts. Yeah, 12 volts. Now, should that be high like that? Yeah, I'm not so sure. 3.3 5 12, but it's coming up as 14.37. Uh, I don't know whether that indicates anything or not. Would that be the sign of anything going faulty? That is shoving through higher voltage or not? Would those extra 2 volt volts cause the problem I'm seeing? I'm not sure. Right, okay, so I've checked every single capacitor on this board here, and to my knowledge, they're all okay. You know, I've done it with this one here, and it's all saying that they're they're good. This one here, I could only do, I think, two of them, because all the others were out of range, so uh, that's the problem with this meter here. So what I'm going to do now is, I'm just going to go across every single solder joint, and I'm just going to reflow it. So I'm just going to basically melt every little bit of solder, uh, just to let it reflow, just in case it is some kind of dried joint somewhere I think it's unlikely but hopefully it won't take me too long so that's what I'm going to do now Right, okay, so I've uh, reflowed everything on that board. Well, not everything. I didn't reflow all these tiny little resistors and capacitors because uh, I was worried about damaging them. My iron's a little bit big, the tip on it for these ones here, so I just reflowed all the sort of, you know, the bigger components. And uh, I've just cleaned it up now. So what I'm going to do is put it all back together. I'm 99.9% .9 sure this isn't going to make a blind bit of difference, but I just wanted to check those capacitors because I did read online that a few people had said that the power board was to blame for the game's not spinning up properly and that's exactly what's happening with me so uh, I just wanted to do it just in case it was going to be an easy fix with a faulty capacitor so now I'm going to put it all back together and then we'll test it right, okay so it still powers up Sounds the same as before. So it's going to stop now in a few seconds. Yeah, exactly the same as before. Right, I'm not really sure where to go from here. 
promise with you to settle my curiosity I'm tempted to go down to CEX in the UK and buy a discounted Dreamcast for £38 I know there's one in stock quite close to me and then I can swap parts around to find out what it is because you know for the learning experience I think it's worth it because I want to know more about this laser showing up as infrared through the camera can even see the red light on it but yet it isn't reading the discs and I'd like to know for example is it the laser part here is it the board down here could it be related to something to do with the power board could it be the motherboard and by swapping parts around I can then pinpoint it down to one particular thing if for example it was the power board I can see that you can buy them on eBay for 9.99 so that would be worth replacing unfortunately the lasers are really expensive probably because you know they're qu they're quite rare and there's a lot of people out there that would like to fix their Dreamcast and I think the lasers are up on like 35 40 pound 35 pound 40 pound that's even from Hong Kong so it's very expensive when you think that you can get a whole Dreamcast for £38. The difference is you can buy one for £38 and it might not last very long because you know the laser might already be on its way out and if you buy a new laser obviously it's brand new and it's probably going to last the next so many years with no problems. The good thing about CEX is they do actually give a two year guarantee with their stuff so in theory it means you're going to have a working Dreamcast for two years for £38 so it's not bad. So I, I am very tempted to do that just so I can actually see what the fault is because again I've spent a long time on this and it's still no but well it's a little bit better than it was it's spinning a bit more now but that's only because I've changed that uh, I've tweaked the potentiometer just back to where it was originally so uh, I think that's what I might do on this one I think I might go and get one and then uh, at least then I'll have peace of mind about what the actual problem is Right, okay, so I did go out and I bought myself another Dreamcast. £38 is not bad considering it comes with a two year guarantee. I got a discounted one, but uh, in the shop, I haven't looked at the shop, but in the shop, it seems to be okay. I mean, it's dirty, but colour wise, it's alright. This works very slow. I'm not sure if it should be that slow or not, but uh, not such a big deal. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping that it does work. If it doesn't work, it's not a problem. I'll take it back and I will get a refund. So, uh, if the laser was to go on this, and it sounds like a lot of them do have the faulty lasers, seems to be a very common fault, whether it's a laser that's causing it or whether it's something else that's causing the laser not to work, but loads of them have this issue, uh, then you know to have it for two years for £38 is not too bad, because obviously if the laser goes faulty, then you can just take it back. So for this video, what I'm going to be doing is just, to begin with, making sure this works, and then I'm going to be swapping bits over, because... For me, it's well worth the £38 just to find out what the fault is. Then once I know, if it was something straightforward, I might be able to then get the part for this and then it would actually save me money by buying this because this could always be sold for a similar price and then you see I would have a working Dreamcast here. So for me, I think it's worth it. Uh, if it's the laser that's 40, I won't be replacing it. But if it was something else, then uh, obviously I would be replacing it. Right, well obviously that is working, so what I'm going to do now is start swapping things over. I think to begin with I will be just swapping the, the drives over and see if that makes, uh, makes a difference because it's so easy to do. All I'm going to do is lift this whole one off because it's got a, just one connection down here. I'm hoping it's not married to the motherboard, I'm hoping you can uh, swap and change them. But that's good news. Right, okay, I'm looking forward to doing this now. Right, so I'm just going to fast forward through this. Oh, here we go. It is working. Look. I just had to go to play. I thought it would start automatically, so I've never owned a Dreamcast. Right, okay, so it is the laser. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm now going to put the faulty one on the good Dreamcast just to see what happens then. There you go, it's failed. Right, okay. So I'm going to break it down even further and then find out. Maybe I'll keep the circuit board from this one and put the laser 
onto the faulty circuit board and then you know see what happens then see if we can pinpoint it just to the laser because it'd be useful to know for future reference in case these prices ever come down or in case I ever get a Dreamcast that you know for spares in which case then I can just use the, the bits I've already done the fault finding on here right so to remember the difference the bad one's got a little sticker on it here and this one is uh, Oh, it's the Yamaha one. Right, okay, that's interesting. So, Yamaha, Samsung. So, realistically now, will I even be able to swap them over? Would it be a direct swap or not? I wonder if the boards are the same. So, obviously, the lasers are going to be different, but I wonder whether the boards at the bottom are exactly the same or not. I wonder whether the Yamaha drives are more reliable than Samsung. Right, okay, let's, uh, let's dismantle this. Right, okay, one thing I forgot to do, which is a bit silly, I didn't actually compare that board with this board here. Uh, but they both say 3.3 volts on them up the front, so I'm hoping it's not going to do any damage, you know, because I don't mind if it doesn't work. It's just that I don't want to actually do, obviously, do damage to this drive here. But if they both say 3.3 volts, I'm thinking I'm going to be okay. Right, so just to recap now, what we have here is the faulty Dreamcast. And I've just got this top assembly here, just this bit here. Yeah, so this is the one from the faulty one, and I've put the good one onto here. So everything else is the original faulty Dreamcast with just this part here that's been changed. And I'm also using the long ribbon cable as well. So let's see what happens. All right, it just stopped. Okay, so it's not liking that. I wonder, could it be the ribbon cable? Or could it be the board down the bottom? Or maybe it's an incompatibility thing between the different laser and the different board. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try this one here. So we've got the faulty laser with the good board and the good ribbon cable, and we'll see what happens here. Right, okay, so this is the good Dreamcast with just the faulty top bit here. So everything else is a good Dreamcast and just this faulty laser up the top. So let's see what happens. Plug it in. Right, so it doesn't look like that's working. No, it's not. So I wonder if you have to marry up the laser with the bottom bit, or is there something else? Right, I've just had a thought. Let's pretend now that it was the actual board of the Samsung drive that was faulty and not the laser. So this is what we think is the bad laser here on the good board. Remember it didn't work, but could that be because I've been mucking about with the calibration on this one, so it might be out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just muck around with tweaking the potentiometer off the bad laser while it's on the good board just to see if it starts to work because then you see that would definitely prove it then wouldn't it because at the moment the good laser is not working on this board here and I don't know on the Samsung board so the Yamaha laser is not working on the Samsung board and I don't know if that's to do with incompatibility or whether this board is faulty obviously the Yamaha works on the Yamaha board and this laser, the faulty laser, the Samsung laser, doesn't work on the Yamaha board. But that could be because I was tweaking this, so it's not at like the factory standard. So that's what I'm going to do now, is I'm going to just start tweaking this one, because I don't want to tweak this one, because this is the good one. I'm going to tweak the bad one on the good board, just to see if we get anything. So that's what I'm going to be working on. Now, in case you're interested, the boards do look very similar. So this is a Yamaha one at the bottom. And this is the Samsung one up the top. And uh, yeah, if you have a look, I mean, I haven't taken down the numbers of every single chip on there. They certainly are, you know, very similar. Mm. 
In fact, just from a quick look, they look to be they do look to be exactly the same. Let's have a look at these capacitors here. C1354120, 54120, L104, L104. So they do seem to be. Yeah, they do seem to be the same. This is different, but uh, I presume they do the same the same job. So you would think if it was the same, then it wouldn't matter by swapping the, the drives over. So maybe it is the board that's faulty rather than the actual laser itself, which would definitely make it more interesting. Check it out. Look at it. It's working. So this is the bad laser on the good board. And what I did is, it only took me a minute to calibrate it because all I had to do... Whoops. All I had to do was a, uh, let me show you that again, hold on. All I did is, I looked where the thing was there. Do you remember I said it about it being at half 12? And I've done exactly the same here now. And if you watch this now, so basically here we have the good Dreamcast with the good board, the Yamaha board, with the bad laser. And it ain't the laser at all. It's not the laser, it looks like it's the board. Yeah, I can hear it's making the right sounds. There you go, look. And that's with the faulty laser. So the laser isn't at fault at all. I'm so glad I bought this other Dreamcast to do the testing because I would have been sure that uh, the fault would have been on the, the laser, but it's not. So now I need to put this whole assembly into the faulty Dreamcast just to make sure it's nothing to do with like, the power board or anything. And then uh, if it's working there, I know definitely it's the board because then the only thing that's different is the Yamaha board. There you go, you can see it working. Well, right, okay, so I'm gonna now put this into that one there and we'll see if it's working. If it is 100% then we know it's the board. I'm pretty certain already it is the board. I'm nearly 100% but I just wanna, I just wanna do that. There we go. So 100% it's the board that drives the laser that's faulty and not the laser. So all that tweaking, uh, all that tweaking is down to something going wrong on that board, isn't it? Rather than the fact that the laser's going wrong because what the sort of forums say, unless I've been reading the wrong ones, is that the, uh, you know, the, well, actually, they're saying that things are wearing down, and that's the reason you haven't got enough power to the laser, which could be true, but everybody seems to think it's a laser problem. I wonder whether they sell these boards, because this is the problem here and not the laser. So, uh, I don't know what to do now. Maybe I'll have a very close look at this board, see if I can see anything. But really, I suppose could it, be, it could be the capacitors, couldn't it? These are, are these capacitors here? Yeah. Maybe some of these capacitors, have, you know, these surface mount capacitors have gone faulty because these were the ones that are in the sound board off the Sega Game Gear. And I know definitely in the Sega Game Gear they go faulty. Maybe some of these are on their way out and that's what's causing it. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Because you could just solder on. You could just solder on new capacitors and then you'd have a working board. I wonder, could that be the problem? Or could it be something to do with one of these chips? Obviously, you guys watching it would have a, a lot better understanding of it than me. But if there's not enough power going through, it could it be? That could be a capacitor thing, couldn't it? Right, okay, I'm going to see. I wonder whether I should try and desolder some of these capacitors, see if I can get any readings off them or not. Because look, this is going to be, for example, this one here would be 100 microfarads, 6.3 volts. 106.3, 116 volts. 106.3, 47 microfarads, 6.3 volts, 116 volts, 47, 6.3, they're mostly the same, 106.3, 106.3, 47, 6.3. So basically, there's only two different types of capacitors on here. Well, that would be a result, wouldn't it? Maybe I'll do that. 
And just in case some of you were wondering, this is the uh, the CD, and that's working as well. So they work. Right, well, okay, I've been trying to test it with this uh, ESR meter here. Now, I'm not 100% sure how to do it because I'm new to this and I've only just got this very recently. But what I've done is I've just gone over every single capacitor and basically just sort of kind of shorted it just in case there was anything left in them. And I'm just seeing the differences between the two boards. Now, I did find one or two capacitors that didn't look great on here, but then again, I found ones that didn't look great on here either. This is the working board, and this is the one that doesn't work. So I'm kind of none the wiser, but let me just show you a couple of ones just to show you what I mean. So basically, I've just attached these little wires onto here, holding them together without actually touching, uh, touching them, zero in the leads. Okay, so that's now zeroed. And for example now, if we were to go on to this one at the top, which is a 16 volts at 100 microfarad, it says here, 16 volts at 100 microfarad, it should be no more than 0 0.7. So this is like the worst case, the worst case, 0 0.7. And if you have a look here, see, it's 2.49 and it says, good if less than 22 UF, but it's uh, it's 100 UF. And if I go on to the same one on this side, it says good if less than two, hold on one second, there. It says good if less than 200, yeah? But it still says 1.1, which is still out of the range anyway, because it should be 0 0.7. But maybe, this one's, you know, about to go, maybe after another so many days use or whatever, or out, you know, so many hours use. Well, this one here might have already gone. So I am wondering, I have actually got a lot of these capacitors because uh, although I haven't got the same voltage, it's the UF, which is the important bit. And these are all either 100 UF or 47 UF, if I'm reading it correctly. And with this pack here, I've got like 47 UF, 25 volts, and 100 UF, 25 volts. These are all 6.3 volts and 16 volts. But, you know, as far as I know, it doesn't matter about the voltage. It's just the capacitance, which is important. So I am tempted to change all these just to see if it makes a difference. I don't know whether it makes a difference me putting electrolytic in if, for example, these are not. I'm not sure what these ones are. Uh, I know on the Sega Game Gear it doesn't make a difference, but maybe that's not as sensitive as this. But I'm thinking it might be worth a go because, you know, I've proved the fault onto the board and there's nothing really else I can test on it or do anything with it. So maybe I'll just unsolder them all, soldering the new ones nice and easy because on the board they've labelled it all up. So, you know, plus there, plus here. So it's going to be easy for me to uh, put them back in because they've put a plus to every single side. This black mark here is the negative side. So I just have to match it up with the negative side on uh, these ones here, which have basically a stripe down one of the sides for negative. Right, okay, I unsoldered all the capacitors and put new ones on. I tried to read them, but they're all coming up with, for example, a 3.3, and it should be uh, 16 volts, 100 microfarads, it should be 0 0.7. And do you know what I think it is? I think it's because this thing here is for measuring electrolytic capacitors, and I haven't Googled it, but these don't look like electrolytic capacitors. I mean, I could be wrong. I obviously, I do not know. I'm just, they don't look like these ones here. So maybe that's the reason because I'm, it's, it's not going to happen where every single one of them are faulty. Anyway, so what I've done is I've just changed all of them over. It was a nice, easy job to do. You can see that I've kind of bent them all out of place so that they're not touching anything else because obviously I don't want them touching other components around the place. Yeah. So, uh, there you go, you can see them all there. Now, will these work in place of these? I haven't got a clue, but the way I look at it is, this board is scrap anyway. The only thing I can test is the capacitors. I don't know how to test anything else. Kind of intrigued about what this is in here, whether this is original or not. Again, I don't know that. Maybe I could look on YouTube. Maybe somebody's got some pictures off this board here that I can compare to. But I'm going to put it all back together and give it a go. I'm not sure if this is going to fit in the same case or not. I've tried to keep them all as flat as could be, but there's a bit of a size difference between these and these, but you never know, it might just fit in. Right, so that's what I'm going to do now. Next time you see this, this will be back in the board.
Okay, so here we go. Now, remember, this is completely now the old faulty Dreamcast because, uh, you know, this is the one from the Yamaha one, this is the Yamaha board, and this is the Yamaha drive. So basically, this is all the old one now, but I have changed the capacitors. So let's see now if it makes any difference. So I'm going to uh, turn it on. Just get controller to plug in. Right, okay, moment of truth, let's see what happens. Doesn't sound great. No, oh, what a shame. I wonder do I have to put more power to it now that I've changed the capacitors. I wonder whether I need to put a little bit more power to the laser. Let's, let's try it because it seems it seemed a little bit weak. Well, right, okay, I can't seem to find the sweet spot on it. That's because I don't think there is a sweet spot. When I changed the board last time, I just turned the potentiometer back roughly to the top, you know, half past 12, and it just works straight away. This time I keep going forward a bit, back a bit, goes a bit fast, go back, and it kind of hesitates, go forward, it goes too fast. So I don't think it should be that fussy. Uh, I, there's Obviously, it's not the capacitors on the board. It was worth a try. I'm going to take it apart one more time just to have a look at the board, see if I can get any other readings from it and compare it to this one over here. Okay, so I've been comparing the two boards with each other, just using like a continuity tester, so it's probably not the best way to do it. Uh, but I can't actually see any difference between them. I've looked online, and annoyingly, I can't buy these on their own. Well, not to the UK anyway. It doesn't seem to be any demand for them, So because uh, I thought I might be able to just get this unit here for relatively cheap, but I can't. What I have done is I've just been looking at the different chips online, and this one here, this chip here, this BA... 5986FM looks like it's the one that controls the speed of the motor. Now, the whole time I've been going on about the laser, you know, is the laser powerful enough, you know, uh, turning that potentiometer and stuff, but if you actually think about it, when it's spinning, it's the spinning that seems inconsistent. So, you know, on the working Dreamcast, it spins nicely. You can hear the laser moving, but it spins nicely. On my one, it's either really sluggish, so it's like, mm, 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 or it goes really, really fast and then sort of dies. Like, vroom, vroom. So I'm wondering if it's a problem with this chip here, which is controlling the motor. So maybe it's not a problem with the laser side of things. It might be a problem with the speed of the motor. So what I'm tempted to do is I've had a look online and you can buy these chips for as little as like, you know, one or two dollars. But obviously they're coming from like China and Hong Kong. So the delivery is going to be a long time on them. I'm tempted to unsolder this one from the good board and put it onto the bad board, so swap them over basically, desolder this, put this one on here, see if it solves the problem. Right, okay, so this is the nozzle that I'm going to be using on the hot air gun. I've taped everything off with the captain tape. I'm going to be using this quick, this chip quick uh, flux that, uh, there you go, it says no clean paste flux. So for rework, solder and desolder. Chris gave me this, he said it was really good stuff. So this is what I'm going to be using. So let's zoom in and let's see how this is going to go. Well, I'm hoping that's enough. I've never used this one before, but I'm hoping that's going to be enough. Uh, and that's it, I'm just going to heat it up now. I'm going to set it as hot as my hot air station will go, which is 480 degrees. And I've got myself some little tweezers here, so we're going to try and... Uh, try and do it. Actually it's going to be easy for me to put this way around. There we go. Actually that lifted really easy. Maybe that flux is the answer to my prayers. Right, okay. I hope I didn't cause any damage there. It came off easy enough. I don't think I've caused damage to it.
Yeah, that board looks pretty good. If the next one comes off as easy as that, I'd be well happy. Right, and that's the uh, that's the chip that's come off it. So what I'm going to do now is get the good board, and I hope now on the good one it will come off as easy. And then, uh, yeah, we'll swap them over and see what's uh, see what's what. Right, so I've got the next one all taped up. Hopefully this will come off as easy. There we go. Excellent, my tweezer skills need quite a bit of work, but uh, yeah, I don't think, I think I might have left a leg behind on that one, hold on. No, maybe not. No, that appears to be okay. So now what I have to do is put the good chip onto the bad board and see if it uh, makes a difference. Now, again, I'm just going to use a little bit of uh, flux. So let's move this over. Run this one now. Sure, I've seen the solder go shiny there. Right, okay, so if it's stuck, that side I think looks okay. That middle one looks like it's covered in solder. They look good there, don't they? They yeah, come out nice. Right, let's have a look at this side. Uh, I don't know whether there's a gap or not in between the leg and the thingy. I suppose what I could do is just um, try to move them. No, they're not moving. Okay, well, they must have made some sort of contact. That looks okay. And I think I think it looks okay. What I'll have to do is just compare the pads on here to see how long they are. So right now I've only got a tiny little bit showing. Look, the whiff of my thing. I mean, the whiff of my tweezers. And if I go to this one here, with my tweezers here. So look, it must have contacted those pads on the inside there. Excellent, right, I'm happy with that. So what I'm gonna do now is, before I solder on this one here, because remember, if it works, there's no point in me soldering this one back onto the good board, because uh, it means this is faulty. So I'm gonna test this now. Obviously, if it works, that's brilliant. Then when I get my new one, I'll put it on here. If it doesn't work, then I might as well put this one on here, and at least then I'll still have one good board. Right, so I'm just gonna clean all this up using a bit of IPA and then uh, put it back in the Dreamcast. Right, okay, so uh, I've got it back in here now. I've still got all the other one dismantled because obviously I'm not sure what I'm doing with this chip yet, whether I need to put it back on or not. So uh, here we go. Right, good news is it hasn't blown up and it looks like it's boot into the same uh, menu. Right, that's good. Disk time, let's see what it does this time. Right, okay, please work, come on now. Oh, that sounds much better. That sounds much better, but I think I'm gonna have to mess around with the calibration. But that sounds strong. Right, I'm not going to do any more. I'm going to. I forgot to put the calibration uh, back to you know the potentiometer. I forgot to put that back to where I think it should be, which is you know about half past twelve. So let me do that now, because now, in fact, by doing that, I might have burnt out that chip. I think it's unlikely though. But did you see that noise it was making? It's never done that before. completely different than it did before. It's weird, the motor feels really strong. 
Uh, you know, the movements there are kind of really aggressive, but yet it's not spinning much at all. Right, I'm so close to giving up on this one now. So what's happening is now, uh, the laser just keeps whacking forward and keeps hitting against the front. And if you have a look here, there's like a little on and off switch at the back. You see I've got, just got my meter across it. And when I press that button, I presume it should turn it off to tell the laser to stop moving. But listen, when I press that in, it's not making a blind bit of difference. So I'm wondering if I've uh, mucked up the soldering on that chip or whether there's something else that's gone faulty on this now. But what's happening is, if I show you, right, so, turn it on. See that? Just keeps hitting against the edge. And even if I let go, it will still just keep doing that. You see? And it must be to do with that on and off switch not cutting off. Because when it's at the edge there, it should, uh, you know, it should cut the signal. So I'm going to have to find out why, uh, why that's happening. I don't know, you know kind of starting to uh, give up on this now because it'd be different if it was working and then that was the problem but you know I, uh, I think this one has uh, I think this one has beaten me well I'm gonna dismantle it again anyway what I'm thinking is if I was to put that chip into the other one and see if it works then at least I know if it's the chip or not see I still think it could be the chip related because it's definitely making a stronger noise now when it's going forward and back but obviously right now it's mucking up because it keeps hitting against that. It's like another new fault on it now. Right, so I'm going to dismantle it and see if I can find anything. Right, okay, this is what I've done just to eliminate the top bit here. Remember, we know that there's nothing wrong with the lasers. There might well be now because of that switch, but it, the fault was on the board. So what I've done is this is the good laser up here from the replacement Dreamcast that I bought from CEX, but I'm using the bad Samsung board. And now if I put this in here and it doesn't work, then I still know then that it must be something to do with the chip or something like that. Or for example, if it keeps doing that thing with the laser, again, I know it's a problem with the board rather than the laser itself. So this is the, uh, the bad Samsung board, but with the good laser on top. So now let's see, see what happens. So I am going to screw that down because it looks a bit crooked. Now let's turn the TV on, get the disc in. Oh, sorry, it's crooked because I haven't put the wires in the right place. See what it does. Oh, I need to plug it in. Right, here goes. No, it's just a problem with the board. Let's just see if it does load up. No. Okay, so it's definitely the board that's wrong. Uh, yeah, so obviously I've uh, mucked something up there, haven't I? Well, okay, I'm going to take it apart again and see. Right, okay, so I've put the bad chip into the good Dreamcast board, the Yamaha board, the suspected bad chip into here, and we're going to see what happens. It went in really nice. I just used the hot air completely. I didn't even try to use a soldering iron. So let's see now what it does. See if it mimics what was happening earlier with the kind of, uh, you know, just spinning a couple of times and stopping. No, it's working. Right, well I'm pleased I've got a working Dreamcast. I'm very pleased because I was really worried there. But it shows you there's nothing wrong with the chip then because that's the bad chip in here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it's gone back to normal. Let me just plug a controller in just to make sure we are going to actually get the game. So, obviously it was nothing to do with that chip. Again, I'm pleased that I did that because I really thought it was the chip and if I didn't do it, it would have always been on my mind that I kind of gave up too early. Uh, but as it stands, I'm kind of back to the beginning now. So I've changed the capacitors, I've changed the chip over and uh, it's neither of those things. So I'm still at a loss. I mean, 100% is the board that's faulty. 
but obviously it's something else on that board. So uh, I think I'm going to have to give up on this one. If you think you might know what it is, perhaps you've already done this, but maybe you don't do YouTube videos. If you know what it is, please tell me. Uh, I mean, it would be helpful if, for example, you could give me, a, uh, you know, like, if you think that's a certain capacitor or a resistor on the board, if you can tell us, you know, what it, what it is. So basically, yeah, you can see that that's working there fine. Right, okay. So, for example, let me get this, uh, this board back out. What have I done with it? Here it is. I reflowed it as well. I put heat on this as well just to melt it again. So I will try it one more time. If, for example, you know for a fact that it's, you know, C505 that's causing the issue or, you know, this chip down here that's causing the issue, please tell me because I can always do an update video on this. Although you're watching this video now, I really have spent a couple of days trying to fix this, which is absolute madness for the price of them. But, I, you know, I really wanted to get it working. When you put more and more time into something, just like those Mega Drive carts, you know, it was no worth spend, not worth spending all that time on, apart from the fact that you get so involved in it, you're desperate to fix it. And I've kind of got that way with this one as well. So 100% I know the fault is on this board. I thought it was the capacitors, it wasn't. I thought it was this chip, it wasn't. So it's something else. And if you know what it is, or if you've got a good educated guess of what it is, obviously I'm not educated in this, so I'm just literally thinking, oh, okay, well, this controls the speed of the motor, maybe it could be that. If you guys know, or you think it could be this component here, which I don't even know what that is, again, please tell me, and then I can do an update video. But unfortunately for this video, I could not get this Dreamcast working, this one over here. I tried my best, but as you've seen, I was unsuccessful. I've learned a lot about them, which is good, uh, you know, which is great because you would never spend that much time on it by just sort of reading up on the internet. By getting stuck in, you'd learn much more. And I have learned a lot. So on this one, what I did is I reflowed everything on the power board. I changed the capacitors over, changed that chip over. And 100% now, I definitely know it's this board here. But unfortunately, that's as far as I can go. So this video is a failure as far as the fixing is concerned, but it's not a failure as far as knowledge is concerned because I've learned a lot. Hopefully it still still gave you some type of entertainment. You know, I love it when I can get something working and in this instance I haven't. But you never know, there might be another episode where I can get it working with the help of you guys. So if you liked it, appreciate if you give it a thumbs up and uh, please subscribe for more trying to fix videos and winning, trying to fix videos and failing and also how-to videos as well. So thank you so much. Take care. Bye now.